This is the Advanced Brain Podcast with third-generation neurotechnology pioneer, entrepreneur, best-selling author, music producer, keynote and TEDx speaker, Alex Doman. Improve your mental wellness as Alex sits down with the leading thought leaders of our time about how to optimize your brain, body, and life with the latest and most powerful tools to help you reach your unlimited potential. This episode was previously recorded and released as part of the Sound Brain Fitness Series and is being re-released here in the Advanced Brain Podcast. Now, listen in and discover how to become the best version of yourself with Alex Doman. This is Alex Doman with Advanced Brain Technologies, and tonight uh, we're really starting off the year right uh, with a discussion on auditory processing disorders, what you need to know uh, with my guest, uh, Dr. Jay Lucker. Dr. Lucker, are you here with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I can hear you perfectly. Thank you very much. And where are you calling in from this evening? Okay, from our home uh, just north of Washington, D.C., in the state of Maryland. Okay, sir, and I am, uh, everyone, I'm joining you from Advanced Brain Technologies Headquarters. We're in uh, Ogden, Utah, uh, just north of Salt Lake City. And looking at our guests for this evening, it looks like we've got callers uh, calling in and listening on the web from a good 20 or so countries and all over the U.S., and we're thrilled to uh, have all of you with us this evening. Uh, this is going to be a, a very exciting call, and we've got a lot of information to cover, so we're going to dive right in. But what I want to do is let you know a little bit about my uh, my guest, Dr. Lucker. He's been my guest before, joined us for the Sound Brain Fitness Series, as well as our TLP Provider Education Series of uh, teleseminars. Uh, we're very honored to have Dr. Lucker as a member of our Scientific Advisory Board. Uh, Dr. Lucker is an Associate Professor in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at Howard University in Washington, D.C., He's also a visiting professor in the Department of Special Education at George Washington University and the Department of Languages and Communication Disorders at the University of the District of Columbia. Uh, Dr. Lucker also has a longstanding private practice specializing in assessment and planning for children, adolescents, and adults with auditory information processing disorders and language processing disorders throughout the greater metro uh, Washington, D.C. area also affiliated as a professional consultant with private practices in Long Island, New York, and Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, you know, Dr. Lucker has been involved with research, clinical work, assessment, and treatments for people with APD since the mid-1970s. He is an author of many articles published in professional journals, book chapters, and he's co-author of a book on APD titled, Don't You Get It? Living with Auditory Learning Disabilities. His present research includes a project looking at the impact of TLP on APD and other issues in students diagnosed with primary emotional disorders. Uh, I've, I've been honored to uh, and am honored to call uh, Dr. Lucker a friend, and uh, I've had the privilege of co-authoring an article with him on um, auditory hypersensitivities in autism and emotional response, and together we're working on a follow-up article on the neural mechanisms involved with auditory hypersensitivity. So, Dr. J, uh, really a, a privilege to uh, have you with us tonight. So thank you uh, so much for uh, taking uh, time out of your very busy schedule of uh, professional time and, and family time to join us this evening. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, all, as always, um, just to give uh, our callers and listeners uh, some background on the call, what we're going to do this evening is we've got a one-hour call. Um, Dr. J is going, going to speak for about 35 minutes uh, on our topic. Then we've got time reserved for a live Q&A session. Uh, we have had literally hundreds of questions submitted for this call. Many of those questions are going to be answered in the body of Dr. Lucker's information. Uh, it won't be possible for us to get to all the questions, but we'll do our best um, to get to all of those. And just in advance, I want to invite all of you 
that want additional information on auditory processing, treatments, and how we may be able to help you at Advanced Brain Technologies, just to give us a call. Uh, we're very happy to give you a free consultation with one of our program consultants, and I'll give you those phone numbers toward the end of the call so you know where to call in for additional help. But for tonight, we're going to explore uh, auditory processing disorders, what happens when the brain doesn't understand what it hears and what to do about it. So we're going to focus on different differentiating auditory processing, a language disorder, and ADHD. We're going to discuss how auditory processing disorders should be assessed, categories of APD in general treatment recommendations, and Dr. Lucker is going to discuss uh, AB, APD intervention with the listening program. So I hope you've all got a, a pencil and paper to uh, write down your questions uh, to follow up with Dr. Lucker and myself. And Dr. Lucker, I want to turn the time over to you now, sir. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, happy New Year to everyone. And um, welcome to 2013. Got to get used to saying that. Um, yes. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, to begin, um, I uh, teach and I also have gone all over the world in many places and have lectured on this. And I typically start at the same point, which is where I'm going to start tonight. And that is to answer the following question. What are auditory processing disorders really all about? So if you listen to that, I'm going to repeat that. Here's your first lesson in auditory processing uh, and language, okay? And that is, I'm going to repeat what I just said. We're going to talk about what are auditory processing disorders really all about. Notice I, I paused for a second to make you think. Uh, the one thing I really want you all to really remember of what I said, and I hope you, pro you processed it, is one small word, R. I didn't say what is auditory processing or what is auditory processing disorders. I said what are auditory processing disorders. And that's something that I hope that you'll really get an understanding of by the time I finish in this short 35 minutes. And that is that there is no one such thing as an auditory processing disorder. And as such, and we'll get to this later, there is then no one treatment for a person having problems processing auditory information because the first thing we have to identify is what is the person's specific problems or what are if it's more than one in auditory processing. So let's begin by first identifying or defining what are auditory processing disorders. Okay. At present, at least here in the United States, we have two primary national associations called the American Speech Language Hearing Association, otherwise known as ASHA, and the American Academy of Audiology, otherwise known as the AAA or the AAA. Um, in 2005, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, ASHA, identified um, or, or published a technical report. And in the technical report, they defined auditory processing, which they call central, with the word central in parentheses, auditory processing and auditory processing disorders, and in parentheses, central auditory processing disorders, identifying that the term APD, auditory processing disorder, auditory processing, central auditory processing, central auditory processing disorders are really the same thing. They're just different semantics, just, just different ways that people talk about the same thing. So please understand what we're talking about tonight. I call auditory processing and auditory processing disorders. And many other people may call central auditory processing or central auditory processing disorders. And hence what Asher did was put the central in parentheses saying you could use the word or you can leave it out. So from now on, I'm going to call it APD or auditory processing disorders or auditory processing, but I mean both auditory processing and central auditory processing. So that's the first thing we need to know. Okay, in 2005 for ASHA and in 2010 for the American Academy of Audiology, the AAA, they further defined auditory processing basically as those things that are occurring only within the auditory system, or the way they say it is the neural activity or the activity of the nerve pathways 
in the auditory system just beyond the inner ear called the cochlea. So starting with what we call the auditory nerve or the eighth nerve and traveling up to the brain via this auditory pathway. And just in general, I'm not going to go into this specifically, but in general, from the auditory nerve, the eighth nerve, the auditory message, which is now a neural message, a nerve transmission message, travels to the low brain stem, then to the upper brain stem, and then it projects into what we call the auditory cortex, that part of our brain that houses the auditory sensory systems. Now, we have two, one on the right side, one on the left side. And if people aren't aware, we have two of a lot of things. We have two motor centers of the brain. We have two sensory centers of the brain. We have two auditory centers of the brain. And they do connect to each other. So the central auditory pathway, which goes from the auditory nerve to the low brainstem, to the upper brainstem, to the auditory cortex, the two cortices, that's the plural for cortex, connect to each other via something called the corpus callosum. And that's the basic auditory system or what we call the auditory pathway. And according to ASHA, according to the AAA, an auditory processing disorder, because they see it only as a single entity, an auditory processing disorder is some breakdown in this neural transmission or nerve transmission or transmission of neural information from the auditory nerve, the low brainstem to the upper brainstem, the upper brainstem to the auditory cortex or somewhere within the auditory cortex or connecting between the two cortices, the right and the left hemispheres via the corpus callosum. So that's the way the traditional approach to auditory processing is viewed. And the reason I bring up the word traditional approach is it's not my approach. And I have had a very differing approach for many years. I believe the very first time I discussed my new approach, or this approach that I developed, was probably in the early 1980s. So it's been a long time. I look at auditory processing and define it in the following way. Auditory processing are those things that the entire central nervous system, the entire brain and brainstem does. When the auditory system receives auditory information, and transmits it to the brain, but there's more than just the auditory system acting on this. There's a lot of systems acting on this. And what I feel good to say today, is now, let's say at least in 2012, since probably around 2010, so the beginning of this, I guess the second uh, decade of the 21st century, more and more of the scientific research is supporting my definitions and beliefs that I've had since, 2000, uh, since 1980, and that is that there's more than just the auditory system involved in auditory processing. And this is important to know because what we see in children who we describe very often as their behaviors look like they have auditory processing disorders may not be due to an auditory system malfunction. And therefore, using this traditional ASHA AAA definition and approach that says that auditory processing disorders, APD, are auditory system disorders only, we may be overlooking factors and possibly mistreating the children. In other words, giving the, di uh, the diagnosis of APD, defining it as an auditory system disorder, treating the auditory system but the problem may not be an auditory problem. So to help differentiate this, I'm using at least three areas that I'll talk mostly about, which is the three that we said we've been talking about. How do we differentiate from an auditory, meaning a problem with the auditory system, an auditory processing disorder that's auditory-based, versus an auditory processing disorder that's language-based, which really would be called the language processing disorder, versus an auditory processing disorder that's really due to what we call the frontal lobes, attention, self-regulation, 
very often psychologists call this executive functioning. And so one way is not to look at the behaviors because the behaviors look the same. I'll give you an example. A person speaks to a child, because we're going to focus on children tonight. However, much of what I'm saying will also relate to older children, adolescents, as well as young adults, older adults, even the elderly, even the geriatric population. But a lot of my work is focused a lot on children and adolescents. So I do apologize for those of you who are more interested in adults or the geriatric population because most of my research has been with children and adolescents. But a lot of what I'm saying really relates to them as well. So a person talks to a child. Very often it's a parent or a teacher. The child doesn't seem to respond or responds inappropriately. Now, right away, the first thing we say is, hey, Johnny, I'm going to use that as a generic. Johnny, are you listening to me? Because we think the child's not hearing or listening. If hearing checks out to be normal, which is the first thing you want to do when you evaluate auditory processing, is to ensure that there's normal hearing, okay? Or if there isn't, to ensure that what we're looking at is not a hearing loss per se. So we're going to say Johnny has normal hearing. Johnny's not listening, but has normal hearing. So someone might say, hmm, looks like it's an auditory processing problem. So here's my example. I'm going to give you an, an example. It's actually from a test. If there are professionals out there, specialized pathologists or even maybe some audiologists or other professionals who are familiar with the test called CASL, C-A-S-L, the Comprehensive Assessment of Spoken Language, you may, re, you may have heard this or you may be familiar with this question. It's a question on a test called pragmatic understanding or pragmatic judgment. And that is, the way the question goes, the second grade teacher said to her class, I would greatly appreciate it if you would remain in the seated position while I absent myself. I'm going to repeat that so we can get it. The second grade teacher said to her class, I would greatly appreciate it if you would remain in the seated position while I absent myself. Well, the question is then, the children don't respond. They don't listen to the teacher. They don't do what the teacher says. Okay? Now, let's think about that. The teacher talked to the kids. The children, we'll make believe it's just one child in the class, Johnny. Johnny does not do what the teacher says. Is it because Johnny had problems processing the auditory information? Or is it because Johnny has no idea what in the world the teacher's talking about? Because the wording, the language used, is very unfamiliar. I hope you agree with me that rarely do you hear people say, I would greatly appreciate it if you would remain in the seated position as opposed to stay in your seat, right? While I absent myself, as opposed to saying, while I leave the room, right? Now, if a child didn't understand what the teacher said, it's, it could very well be because they don't understand the use of the language that the teacher is using. That would be a language processing problem, not an auditory processing problem. Changing the auditory environment, speaking slower, speaking clearer, helping the child distinguish the phonemes, the sounds of speech, is not going to get that second grader to sit in his seat and while the teacher leaves the room unless the child understands the language used. So that's an example of a language processing problem. So let me now give you an example of how language changes based on auditory rather than language. And we'll see what an auditory processing problem could be like. Okay? A child is walking towards the door and the teacher says to the child, Johnny, look out the door. I'll repeat that, okay? The teacher says to the child, Johnny, look out the door. So these are the four words the teacher said. Look out the door. And Johnny goes and looks out the door and gets smacked in the head by the door. 
because what the teacher really did is pause between the word out and the, but Johnny's auditory system didn't process the pause. Johnny heard the four words, look, out, the, door. Linguistically strung it together as a string that said, go see what's there. Would you agree? Look out the door. But what the teacher really said was, Johnny, look out the door. I'll repeat that. Johnny, look out the door. Notice the pause between out and the has changed the entire meaning of the utterance, look out the door, to mean don't you dare look out the door. Get a, be careful, look out. A warning, warning. The door is going to hit you. Not go see what's there. And that's an example. Okay? That's the difference, or one example of a difference between an auditory processing problem and a language processing problem that affects our ability to understand what we hear. Now, for the child with the, with the timing difference, who doesn't get these timing components called temporal processing disorder, in at least the field of auditory processing and in my model or approach to auditory processing, needs to learn to hear those differences because those timing differences can change the meaning of the utterance, also the emotional meaning. And I'll give you an example. The teacher says to the class, everybody, please stand up. Notice it? Everybody, please stand up. Listen to the rhythm. Listen to the speed at which I say it. Everybody, please stand up. Now, if I said that to you, would you get out of your seat? I hope you would. Okay, you, you want to be nice. You, you like me. I'm a good teacher. So you're going to get up. But how quickly would you get up? You take your time. The teacher's not rushing. But what if the teacher said, everybody, please stand up. Notice I said the same four words, but the emphasis, the volume change, the rhythm change, the speed changing in the words, said, you better do it now. And also, I'm a little annoyed, as opposed to, I'm a, little, I'm a nice guy. So the thing is that emotional interpretation, which is a problem that many children with auditory processing problems can have, not that they do have, but can have, because many don't, okay, can be due to these temporal processing differences, these volume processing differences. Other children may have language processing problems, and still others may not be able to understand what's being said to them because their systems, their brain, is not able to focus or stay attentive long enough to get the whole message. So here's an example. Remember, the second grade teacher said to our class, I would like everybody to remain. And that's all that you processed. As soon as I continued saying the rest of the sentence, your system stopped paying attention because it noticed that there was a sunbeam floating into the room. And you decided to look at the sunbeam rather than listen to the teacher. So, you did stay in the room because that's exactly what the teacher said. That's what you processed. You got, everybody, please remain. Now, what you didn't get is in your seats. Right? So you got up out of your seat. You did not leave the room. Teacher comes back. You're the only one out of your seat. Teacher gets annoyed that you're out of your seat, and you get very upset and annoyed at the teacher, even though you're not going to take it out necessarily on the teacher. Some may, but some may, some may not, because you didn't get the whole message, but you did do what you believe the teacher said. Remain. Stay. You did. So this is an attention problem. Children have, can have problems paying attention, staying attentive to the listening task long enough to get all the information that's spoken to them, which kind of jumps to the next topic that we said we're going to cover, assessment. Okay, so I hope you're gathering from what I'm saying here that auditory processing is a lot more complex than just saying a question to a child getting a response and saying the child got it right, the child got it wrong. And therefore, assuming if the child gets all the auditory questions wrong or most of the questions wrong, the child has an auditory processing problem. 
may not be. Could be the child's not able to sustain attention and self-regulate to know, am I paying attention long enough? Or the child may be impulsive, so they get part of the message, they've interpreted it long enough to do it. Here's an example. Okay, parent says to a child, I want you to go upstairs and, and the kid goes upstairs. And then the parent comes running after the child saying, you're not listening to me. You didn't do what I said. So he says, yes, I did. You said go upstairs. But what the parent really said was, I want you to go upstairs and make your bed. Or I want you to go upstairs and clean your room. And the kid's not cleaning his room. He's just upstairs because he's impulsive. He heard the message, interpreted it, and acted on it before it was an appropriate time to act. Again, a problem with self-regulation, not auditory processing. It's not the auditory system that's doing it. And not language because the kid understood what was being said. So, what's involved in assessment? Assessing all of these systems, not just the auditory system. And whatever assessment we're using, regardless of what it is, we're looking at all of those factors. We are using assessments that control variables so that if we're testing auditory components, we know it's not the language that's confusing or causing the child not to be able to do the task or the cognitive demands of the task that, are, that the child cannot handle. Okay, you know, that we're asking the child to, you know, search through a, a hidden, you know, puzzle of some kind, and the child doesn't understand what they're supposed to be looking for, and that's why they can't find Waldo. Okay? So, uh, you know, not that kind of a test, and that's a visual, but I use that as an analogy on the auditory system, but that the child, that we're controlling the variables. For example, when I do auditory processing testing, all my testing is done under earphones, so that the level of loudness is controlled. Every one of the tests that I use is pre-recorded, so that if I see 100 children over the course of time, and I play those recordings 100 times, they will be hearing the exact same person, the exact same voice, the exact same volume or intensity level, because it's always the same intensity, if the children have normal hearing. If they have a hearing loss, then I have to modify, but I have to put in my report that I've modified that I've adapted to the child's hearing loss. But typically, most children have normal hearing who come for auditory processing testing. They're all tested at the same volume level, normal conversational level. They're all tested with pre-recorded material so that we cannot say the child could not understand. Excuse me one second. Oh, excuse me. I just sneezed. I apologize. They couldn't understand because of the accent was different but the person speaking is the same each time. So that's how auditory processing should be assessed. But then what comes more important to me, because the testing of auditory processing and learning how to do the testing very often. Oh, another fact I'm going to back up, I apologize. In the testing is that not only are we looking for the auditory components, but they were also looking at the language components. So in other words, if we are using verbal material, do we have a baseline that the child, let's say we're listening, we're testing speech understanding with background noise, because that's part of the testing that's used. Have we also tested speech understanding using the same verbal material without background noise? Because see, let's say, say the word chair. You can say chair. Then I put background noise in, and it's say the word chair, but you can't say the word chair. I would know then, since you could say the word chair in quiet, but you can't say it with the background noise, it's the noise that caused you not to be able to say the word chair. Okay? Something about the noise. Okay? Don't know yet why, whether the noise distracts the auditory system because it can't filter well, or whether you couldn't pay attention because of the noise. Don't know yet, but at least we know it's the noise. But if I only gave the test, which is what many professionals do, is just listening to these words with background noise, and you fail, let's say, 10 of the words, and let's say you're not supposed to fail more than five of the words, you failed the test. The problem is, could you have failed it also if there were no background noise? In other words, do you have difficulty just repeating the words? Do you have difficulty in just hearing the word and discriminating the word hair from chair, as an example, or share? Okay, so I want to make sure that I've controlled those factors. 
The other thing I want to control for and evaluate is to look at attention. So what I do is there are tests of auditory attention that are used to see whether or not a child can attend. The other thing is, let's say you give a list of words and the child stops, all of a sudden, in the middle of the list, it stops repeating. Often what I have seen, because I teach, I see my students do this, they'll mark it wrong. And then the next word, the kid doesn't repeat, they mark it wrong. Then the third word, the child doesn't repeat, they mark it wrong. And then I usually will, if they're in training, will stop the student and ask the child, are you ready? And I see, what was that last word the man said? 90% of the time, the child would very often say the correct word. They just weren't responding because of an attention problem, not an auditory processing problem. So I want to make sure that we're looking at attention as well as auditory processing, as well as other factors that can affect us, such as anxiety or emotional problems. And that comes now into the different categories. So there are different categories. There is no one such thing as auditory processing. There are different categories. So the first category that I look at is whether or not a child is even sensitive and aware of sound. Among the kind of clients that I see, very often are children diagnosed as being in the autism spectrum. We'll call it autism spectrum disorder. So it's a whole spectrum of disorders. Many of those children are undersensitive to sound, or what I call hypo-responsive or hyposensitive. And very often, they don't respond when they hear the recording saying, say the word, say the word. I very often have to cue them every time. Here comes the man. Here it is now. Bingo. And then it says, say the word, chair. Here comes the man. Here it is now. Mm. Say the word, house. Comes, you know, to kind of, because they're not responsive when the man talks. Now we question, why is it that they're not responsive in the real world? Because they're not aware that they're supposed to be listening to everything or to those things that are being said in the world. They're not pulling it out. The alternative to that are children who are hypersensitive, overly sensitive. Now, many of us look at this from a qualitative observational point of view. Johnny can't stand when there's certain noises around. He puts his hands over his ears. Please know that is a child who is overly sensitive, but it may not be to the sound. It may be to the situation. It may be to a couple of other things. In my research and an article that, as of the first of the year yesterday, I just found out, is being published in a journal called Focus on Autism, it discusses testing, formal, standard, objective, not subjective, observing, but objective measures of auditory sensitivity in children in the spectrum and, and comparison group that are not in the spectrum but have auditory sensitivity problems. And what I found was that for children in the spectrum, about 30% of them have intolerance to loud sounds and they are very distracted and annoyed by sound. The other 70%, that's a high number when you think about it, the other approximately 70% of these children have no problems dealing with loud sounds when the sounds are abstract, so it's a situational thing that they're responding to in the real world, or the sound is not linked to a specific environment. Okay? They don't have auditory sensitivities. They can tolerate extremely loud sounds, sounds that are close in loudness to the, you know, if you've ever gone on an airport where you have to walk out into the runway, not the runway, but out on the tarmac and the jet engine and the, the engine is revving up, that volume level of sound, which is approximately 120 dB, what we call A, or dBSPL, so it, it relates to about 110 dB of sound. And I actually measured, under some test conditions, kids up to 110 dB of sound, and they didn't flinch. They, they just continued, you know, participating in the activity. So it wasn't that they shut down appropriately without responding to the sound. So there's this measure of auditory hypersensitivity as opposed to a measure of hypersensitivity that's not auditory-based. But that's really the article that Alex was speaking about earlier that he and I published in the Autism Science Digest 
in the spring 2012, which talked about auditory hypersensitivity more as an emotional-based problem. And I think for an overwhelming majority of children, both those in the spectrum as well as those not in the spectrum with sensitivity, hypersensitivity, observe behaviors. They cannot tolerate sounds. They cannot put up with these sounds. It's more emotionally based. Their emotional system can't deal with it, not just not the auditory system at the time we're seeing the children. So that's another category. The next thing we do is we extract, like I talked about the temporal, the timing. We extract the timing between words. If the timing is a certain timing, we get one meaning. If the timing is different, it's a totally different meaning, sometimes on an emotional level. The other thing we extract is the discrimination of phonemes. Those, the differences that make a P, as in Peter, the difference between P and B as in boy, or P as in Peter and T as in Tom. Okay, we often see these discrimination problems in people with hearing loss because the cochlea, the hearing system in the inner ear, isn't working properly and they can't make these fine discriminations. And so we have these phoneme discrimination, or what I call phonemic extraction kinds of problems. They don't extract the, the distinctive features that tell what the difference between a P and a T. If you hear me on the phone, I'll try to say it as good as I got you know, has more noise to it. That's really, you know, there's a couple of other features to it, but that's one that at least we can put our finger on. And here, and a little child even, you know, four or five years old, can learn the difference between a long sound and a short sound, like a T versus an S. The, the main difference auditorily between a T and an S for a little kid is one's long and one is short. T is short, S is long. So that's a difference. They're very similar other than that acoustically except for the, the uh, explosion because of the shortness of the T. Another category is at the linguistic level, and that is what I call lexical extraction. If any of you have taken a foreign language, you may remember at the very beginning when you first learned the language, you're sitting in class listening to every word a teacher is. Now, if I went on like this, I'm sure you'd get bored, <laughs> Okay. But imagine trying to process every single word you hear. Your system would become overwhelmed and overloaded. And many of us, we get overloaded, so we guess as much as we can and try to guess. But for a lot of kids especially, they not only get overloaded by all of this, they get overwhelmed. It's just too much. And that too much becomes an emotional drain. And then they become anxious. Because the next person speaking to them, first thing they're thinking is, oh my God, is he also going to say, or she also going to say, too much that I can't handle. So their system, just to protect them, shuts down and stops processing. So we may have emotional interference, not just on the hypersensitivity end, but also on this overwhelming end of processing. Next category, attention. We talked a little about that already. Is the problem due to attention, which is an attention self-regulation disorder, or is it really due to the fact that the child is, just, is interfered with, that if there's background noise, I can pay attention, but there's just too much to, to filter, and I can't. So I filter too much noise, I'm going to filter everything, including the person speaking. So I'm not going to get what they're saying clearly because I'm filtering too much. So I'm distracted with, by or annoyed by that factor, which could be emotional, or I'm distracted by it, and I just try to do my best, but I just can't do it. Poor filtering that occurs because of this auditory distractibility and auditory system issue, or is it attention? I can't pay attention. I don't want to attend to the story that I'm listening to or to the person speaking to me. All that noise in the cafeteria or the person who's sitting right next to me telling me, could you please pick up my fork I dropped? Okay. Next category, integration. We get these little pieces. We want to put them all together. So prior to that, we have another subcategory, if you want to call it, or another category, memory. We have to take the pieces we did extract properly, that we got appropriately, that we discriminated properly, that we attended to properly, and that we got all that information they're little pieces, like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. We've got to put them all together. So the first thing we've got to do is remember the pieces we got. And many children have problems with auditory memory. 
Very often, the auditory memory problems are more cognitively based. For example, a child trying to remember every individual thing doesn't work, as opposed to another child chunking or organizing, which does work. So that children with memory problems, we have to check it. Is it an attention issue that's causing the memory problem, executive functioning, or is it a cognitive factor? They don't have the skills of knowing how to chunk, organize, group, or is it a problem in the child not being able to take in the right information auditorily so that they can have the right information to put together to integrate it into the whole. And that's that next level, that integration level. To me, the integration level is the ability to form meaningful mental images. Meaningful mental images. Okay, I'll give you an example that you know what I'm talking about, right? It's a story of a girl. She has a red coat on that has a hood that goes over her head. She's carrying a basket. There's woods. There's a wolf. There's a house at the other end of the woods. There's a grandmother. I bet you can tell me that story. What I just gave you were the key pieces. I extracted only the key pieces, and you know the story, hopefully, if you're familiar with the story of Little Red Riding Hood, as opposed to a girl. And her color is yellow her hair. She also goes in the woods. She sees a house, but it's empty. She goes in. And the other key component are three bears. I don't have to tell you all the other pieces, I hope, but you already got Goldilocks and the three bears, and you probably already see the picture in your head of her sitting at the table and the chair being too big or comfortable and breaking the baby, you know, the little baby's chair, and the porridge being too hot, too cold, and just right, eating up all the porridge and falling asleep in the baby's bed. And when bears come home, they scare her, and she never gets in trouble for breaking and entering. Often wanted that. No, that's a joke. So, what do we do to help these children? How do we help these children? Identify first the category of disorder. Oh, last category, I forgot. Organization. Many children do get the information, but they don't understand the sequence of what the information means or the order organization. And, you know, a good example is parents saying to a child, your room is a mess. I want you to go up and straighten it. Okay, now we're going to have dinner, so you go upstairs fix everything up, and then come down when you're finished. Now, notice, I put the dinner in be between everything. I talked about your room being a mess. I didn't tell you when you go upstairs, where you're supposed to go. But the organization of that whole thing is you go upstairs to your room. It is a mess. Clean it up. When you're finished cleaning up your room, you want to come down, and you can join us for dinner. But that's not the way I said it. And there are some children who can't get that sequence of things and don't understand the sequence they, they need it to be spelled out to them. They need it to be told to them. This is first, this is second, this is third. And they need to learn to identify and, uh, and label things. As what comes first? What's it, what, what goes together? What comes, you know, after what? And what do I do first and stuff like that? Okay, so the next thing is intervention. How do we help these children? Well, for auditory problems, we deal with the auditory. For example, phonemic awareness, if it's discrimination, you don't teach discrimination by telling me it's the same or different. That's the, that's the test of it, not the training of it. You teach me features. Teach me what is it that I'm supposed to know. So if you say to me, is, are these two sounds the same? And I say a voiceless TH, like in thumb, versus a T, like in Tom. They say, no, they're not the same. Okay, so what's the difference? Well, the first one you said, we'll make believe it's the thumb, was long. The second one was short. Okay, the first one was very soft. I could just barely hear it. The second one, I heard a little bit of an explosion. Notice, I am not discriminating pH from T. I'm discriminating the distinctive features of one phony from the distinctive features of another phony, which I then can learn linguistically to label as TH or T or S or T or whatever the sounds are. Okay? Linguistic or lexical extraction is to teach a child how to do things. I usually like following directions by learning how to find the keywords 
and use only the keywords to follow the whole direction. Temporal processing, I very often will present things with no temporal order at all to older children. The younger children, I use compound words. For example, what's the difference between a fire man and a fireman? And how would you know which one it is? And very often I, we, we use pictures so that the fire man is a fire, like, you know, a fire, you know, a campfire, okay? And a man is a man. Whereas a fireman is the guy, you know, typically dressed in a red uniform, right, or wearing the red suspenders. Why does a fireman wear red suspenders? Because green wasn't a good color. No, it's because to hold up his pants. No. Um, the thing is that we have, and then how do you know which is which? You know, here in the D.C. area, one of the things we often use is, how would you know to go to the White House as opposed to the White House? You know, and the difference between that timing, the pause between it with young children, with older children, I do things like, I give them sentences like, look out the door. Ask them, can you tell me the two different meanings and how we know the difference between these? Okay. From the, I'm jumping to the integration. I give them the pieces and see if they can put it together to form the whole. Then I give them the whole and ask them, can you identify the proper pieces so that I would put it together and draw a perfect picture? And sometimes we play games of drawing things, but all you're allowed to tell me is one word or two words, not the whole sentence. Like if I said circle, you could draw a circle, right? Now, if I wanted you to, let's say, put a, you know, like a stick figure, a line, like a lollipop, right? I might say lollipop stick, okay? I know it's two words, but still, it's not the whole thing. And then from the lollipop stick, you might have the arms coming out. We have to figure out how would I explain to you with just key words how to do that. Because that's what we need to do for memory. Right? Just the key words are what's important for memory. And the other fact that the memory is also how to chunk things. How to organize information in memory. How to associate things. You know, what the important words that we need to use for memory, not all of them, just the key words. And for organization, how do we sequence things? Give things out of sequence, see if the child can give the sequence to it with no visual cues, eventually. Okay, so those are the kinds of general things. What I've missed, if, you've heard, if you haven't heard, is the background noise distractibility stuff and the hypersensitivity and hyposensitivity. I think there's a large component of the undersensitivity, the oversensitivity, and the background noise distractibility, and the children who have the overwhelming problems that are emotionally based. And what I have found to be very, very helpful to reduce this emotion, to open the auditory system so the child says, ah, oh, listening is a fun activity, not an overwhelming, overloading, fearful, anxious activity, is through the use of something like the listening program. And I love the listening program. I'm a strong advocate of the new WAVE program with the listening program, which I think is not just giving you the normal listening we get, but that extended listening through the bone conduction as well as the sensory stimulation in the vestibular system that really calms the system, opens the auditory system, starts allowing you to filter, especially using the open I believe it's called the open earphones, so that we're filtering, learning to filter some of that background noise while I'm really listening to the music and eventually calming me to really want me to listen so that my brain and my system will want and have the desire to listen and then learn with practice with background noise and then practice when I listen to the sounds that I, it's called desensitization, the sounds that I was fearful of before that I can learn to tolerate them. So that's kind of my overview of auditory processing. I know I think I went a few minutes over. I apologize. Um, but I do want to take any questions that might exist. Uh, Dr. Lucker, uh, an, an incredible amount of information to cover in a relatively short amount of time. Um, I, I know you can lecture on this for quite some time, but I, I think you really did an excellent job of providing a, you know, an overview and, and, and importance of differentiating the need that auditory processing language disorders, ADHD, are in fact different things that often look like the same. 
um, the importance of assessment, and I know practically speaking, um, looking at so many different areas that can contribute to an auditory processing disorder. Where does a parent begin in trying to find the answers to what's going on with their child? What, what, as an audiologist, as a speech pathologist, uh, as an educational psychologist, where is your background of where does your recommendation on where parents should begin this journey of finding answers for their kids? Uh, in general, we'll start with, let's say, just, I observe problems with my child and I don't know where to go. The first thing is gather as much qualitative observational information as you can. Okay? Example, are things that I see at home similar to what parents, uh, sorry, you're the parent, similar to what teachers or even in preschool, the preschool teachers or whatever you call them or in daycare, the daycare workers are seeing in the child. So see if there's patterns, and if there are, are people complaining mostly of A or B? Let's say, you know, I look at Johnny, and every time I call his attention, he just doesn't seem to be paying attention. You know, at home, he just does So if the common ground seems to be not paying attention, I would first check out self-regulation, attention, and what's called executive functioning, which is done by a clinical psychologist or neuropsychologist. And money is going to be an issue, so I'll say many clinical psychologists are very competent to do this. Many don't have the background in the neuropsychology of going into the executive functioning. But that's one way to go. Another way, I notice that if I slow down, if I speak clearer, the child says, that sounds more like it's auditory. There, I would say maybe the first person to see would be maybe the audiologist who specializes in auditory processing. And for the listeners here, and I don't know what it's like in other countries, um, but I can say that here, even in the United States, there are many audiologists. There are many. However, there are very few who, A, truly understand how to interpret and break down auditory processing test findings into the different categories because most of them are trained according to the model that I explained, which is auditory processing is one thing and everyone gets the same treatment and it's a one size fits all. And please, when I say this, since we're all here, is that traditionally the way people are being trained, things like the listening program are not being accepted and are not being tra uh, taught to our audiologists. They don't know about it. And yet it is a great program to help these children who have you know, many of these auditory issues, especially, as I said, the auditory sensitivity, hypersensitivity, distractibility kinds of issues, and the overwhelming, overloading kinds of issues. The third possible way is, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. Well, the audiologist is going to look at the auditory system. Speech language pathologists are going to look just at the language system primarily. Okay, they may look at other things primarily. Occupational therapists tend to look at the sensory motor systems primarily. I'm not saying totally, because there's those few good people out there who look at the whole child. But that's the, the tradition. But the neuropsychological evaluation is like a umbrella. It looks at every, a lot of aspects. At least the neuropsychologist that I work with in, in my private practice is a neuropsychology practice. The neuropsychologists that I work with, they usually use the same sensory profile that OTs use. So that's their sensory screening. They do at least some kind of language screening. Now, it's not an in-depth testing. They'll do some language testing. They'll do some listening tasks. They'll do attention tests. They'll do tests of executive function. They'll look at memory. They'll look at cognition. So I would say, if you don't know where to start, there's a good place to start because the neuropsychological evaluation from a neuropsychologist or clinical psychologist very often gives you an overview of the child. The problem is it doesn't go in depth enough but it may say, oh, this looks more like a language-based issue. Then you can go to the speech language pathologist. Oh, this looks more like a, a sensory-based issue, a sensory motor issue, including visual motor. Then you can go to the OT. Or this looks more like it's a listening auditory issue. Then you can go to the audiologist. But, if, you know, if time and money is not the issue, which it always is, unless, you know, since we just finished, uh, what you call it? 
New Year's, and I don't know if you all watched the Twilight Zone Marathon, but if you know that one thing where the guy had the stopwatch and he could stop time, if we could stop time and freeze it and have, you know, appointments one right after the other, to me, the ideal would be, and I don't care who you start with, a team approach with a neuropsychologist, an occupational therapist, a speech language pathologist, and an audiologist who are trans disciplinary, understanding all of these areas and working together as a team, as opposed to only understanding their specific area. So, you know, I hope I, we have those professionals out there. I, I, Dr. J., you know, th- this is not simple, and I, I think it's very, very useful for you to share this uh, transdisciplinary approach, just as our TLP provider base um, come from multiple disciplines, many, many, many of our listening program providers work in transdisciplinary teams. Uh, so uh, that that's great advice. Now, we've had a number of people uh, ask, and we've just got a few minutes, and there are literally hundreds of questions, so I'm just going to summarize some of these this evening and, and try to give as many people help as possible. Um, do you believe that there is a rise of auditory processing issues? You've been working in the field for many decades. Do you see this on an increase, or do we have uh, an increase in understanding? I think it's twofold. I think we have an increase in understanding. Therefore, we're better able to identify and differentiate auditory processing disorders. However, I apologize to say this again. I'm talking about the United States. I don't know about the rest of the world. We're also um, toxic. Is that the way to say toxifying? I don't know what the way to say. There's so many toxins that we're putting into our environment that unfortunately we're developing a lot of children with neurological developmental problems. And the other thing is, whereas many, and I apologize for any parents who have children in this situation, whereas when I was a child, okay, and I'm 22, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. As you said, I was, I've been doing this since, you know, the 1970s and, you know, developed my model in the 1980s, so I'm not at that age. <laughs> but in my era, a lot of the children who are alive today would either have been institutionalized, so we'd lock them away and not care about them at all, or they probably would have been aborted or not born. So the thing is that I think we are successfully bringing into the world and now better able to deal with people with a lot of differences. So that's increasing then the neurodevelopmental issues plus the toxins that are in the environment are increasing neurotoxicity and neurological issues and neurodevelopmental problems of children. And also because the children are surviving and part of this can be genetic, they are marrying and having children. So I think that that's it's kind of a combination of things that are going on. So, you know, going to cause, and I know Dr. Judith Belk, who is, a, you know, a, a, a colleague in, in the field of audiology, mm-hmm. um, you know, asked, you know, an understanding of the current causes. So one I'm hearing, you believe there are environmental influences, uh, which I wholeheartedly agree with. Uh, two, there, there are hereditary genetic factors uh, that are involved. Um, we're, we're also aware that neurological injury uh, can contribute mm-hmm. to auditory processing issues, and I and I think it's important that people understand that there there is a high rate of comorbidity of um, auditory processing disorder, along with other things, secondary to Down syndrome, brain injury. Uh, you can have comorbidity, and and tell me if you do disagree with uh, ADHD and CAPD. Oh. You can in fact have kids that have both. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. The same with autism. The same with autism. And and, and you know? autism spectrum disorders, sensory right. processing disorders, but generally the APD is secondary uh, in in the diagnosis. And uh, one other important thing that has been brought up is why aren't schools recognizing it, and why is APD not rec- recognized in the diagnostic and statistical manual? Why is there not a formal label and therefore coverage and treatment? Uh, for auditory processing through insurance and in the schools. And we've got about one one minute to address a, a, yeah. a very big topic. Real quick, schools. It is addressed in the schools. 
I refer those of you, and I, I'm not sure if it's, if it's free available on the line or not, but in the Journal of the American Academy of Special Education Professionals, 2012, I believe it was either the winter, I think it was the winter last year, so about a year ago, it was published, I published an article called What Special Educators Need to Know About Auditory Processing. What is available online is in the Journal of School Psychology, also 2012, it was the summer that I published something that came out, um, and that is available. In both of those articles, I reference the IDEA, and everyone knows IDEA, right? IDEA and now the IDEA. And in the IDEA, the definition of a specific learning disability is a disorder in one or more of the psychological processes that includes, and I'll summarize this quickly, listening to spoken language. You know, it's disorders of listening to spoken language. It's actually disorder of understanding spoken language due to a listening problem. And I hope you would agree with me because I feel strongly about this. And that is, that's an auditory processing disorder. And it was there when IDEA was written. It was there when PL94142 was written. So it is covered in the schools. Schools just don't want to recognize it. Now, the DSM-4, for those of you who are medical people, this may be a little redundant. The DSM-4 was developed by psychiatric medical doctors. It is a diagnostic statistical manual of psychiatric disorders originally. It is medical disorders. Auditory processing disorders were felt to be developmental in nature by the AMA, the Medical, medical Association, and therefore they will not see it as a a, psychiatric disorder, B, a psychological disorder, and C, a medical disorder. Yes, those same stupid people, and I apologize if any are out there, but you can tell my passion here, put into the ICD codes a disorder called 389.14, central hearing loss, defined as a hearing loss not due to a disorder in the cochlea, but a hearing loss due to the inability to use auditory information due to some abnormality in the brain. Now, to me, that's auditory processing disorder. It is there. So I don't know why. The reason they're not using it is the longer they can say they're not using it, the fewer ICAP or APD evaluations they will have to do. Therefore, they don't have to pay for it. Two is, let's say they do identify it in the schools. Who's going to treat it? Because the school uh, you, people don't know how to treat it. So parent, parents have to be detectives, and they have to they have to advocate, and they need to find the advocates in the system. You know, we have many, many school systems, uh, Dr. Lucker, that do, in fact, pay for the listening program for students under IDEA um, right. and other programs. So it is happening, but parents need to go in and be advocates, and the teachers in the schools need to be advocates for the children as well. So, uh, Dr. Lucker, may I ask, for those that are on the, on the phone and want to learn additional information about your work, what, what's, the, what's the best way to source that? Okay. Well, <laughs> as most people do, my name is L-U-C-K-E-R. First name is J, and my middle initial R. But I would, don't put the middle initial, but the reason is that my cousin is J.K. Lucker, wouldn't you know? And if you just do a Google search or a Yahoo search on J. Lucker, auditory processing, uh, you'll probably get over, I don't know if you've ever done it, what, over a million hits, over 10,000 hits, whatever. So there's a lot that you can find there. As I said, the, the School Psychology Journal article is online. Our article, I believe, you still have online, right? Yeah, we our, our article from Autism Science Digest is available on advancedbrain.com. Right. Right. Under the articles um, in the company information. Yeah. And what I'd like to offer, and, you know, if I'm doing it on the phone wrong and you need to shoot me, just come down and shoot me. But I'd like to offer somewhere, and I'm happy to do this, if people have questions and would like to write into ABT, and then I could respond to them, I'd be happy to do so. 
very, very happily for any, and, and Dr. Lucker, that's very generous. So uh, if anyone writes info at advancedbrain.com and put in your subject line, question for Dr. Lucker, we will make sure that uh, that question reaches Dr. Lucker so he can, in fact, correspond with you. That's a very generous offer. Uh, offer, so we certainly appreciate that. Uh, for those of you on the phone that want to uh, understand more about how the listening program uh, can help uh, with an auditory processing issue, we also want to offer a free consultation to you. So if you're in the United States, you can call and set an appointment with a program consultant by calling 888-228-1798. Let me repeat, 888- 228-1798. If you're calling internationally, uh, plus one, eight zero one, six two two, five six seven six, and we uh, will be able to assist you and also direct you to a listening program provider in your area, uh, wherever you are in the U.S. So we invite you to call us. Uh, we're here to support you. Uh, Dr. J, uh, thank you very much for your time and thank you to all of our listeners. And a parting question. Um, and we're going to continue the conversation on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash advanced brain technologies. When you think about your own auditory processing, what is the sound that's most meaningful to you? Thank you for taking your time to join Dr. Lucker and myself this evening. Uh, we wish you all sound health. Dr. Lucker, thank you again for your time and this very valuable information. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. Good night. Be well, Happy everyone. Thank you for listening to the Advanced Brain Podcast with best-selling author, keynote speaker, and founder of Advanced Brain Technologies, Alex Doman. In the show notes, you can find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode. Please subscribe to the podcast from whichever platform you might be listening in. Of course, it's free to subscribe, and it ensures that every time we post a new episode, you'll find it right there waiting for you to listen to in your podcast app of choice. And for more information regarding the world's most innovative neuroscience-based music programs for optimal human performance, please visit advancedbrain.com. Dot com.